Welcome to Fantasy Football Today Dynasty. It is our wide receiver preview for the 2024 NFL Draft, and we have Matt Waldman, Dan Schneier, here with me, Heath Cummings, to break it all down for you, Matt. I know, because I've heard from people, everybody was so excited to have you back on the show. I can't wait to talk to you about these wide receivers. Oh, man, that's a, always a pleasure to get a chance to chop it up with you guys. I look forward to this whenever we get the chance, and uh I appreciate I'm glad that the feedback has been good and that you you know that they want me back on so that's good <laughs> Dan you know it's almost been as long it feels like since I've talked to you as it's been since I've talked to Matt you just not been a part uh I guess it was about a month and a half ago that we did a mock draft together we did how mock. How, how how deep into the weeds are you getting on this class is Fantastic. So so deep into the weeds. We just did on our show our Marvin Harrison profile. We're doing Romo Dunze today. I'm excited for that. Was just watching some tape before this to prepare for the show. And you know what's funny? It's kind of like Christmas for the draft season when the RSP comes out because we I have a bunch of different draft chats and I had a bunch of different people talking last night about some things that they saw in there. People grilling me on some of my quarterback stuff. So I'm excited to see to talk another time, maybe quarterbacks with Matt, but I'm also excited to hear his takes on receivers because we have some interesting uh, developments there as well. So just always exciting when, when the RSP drops, because you always seem to get the draft chats just popping off. And I think that that's an excellent transition. Dan's clearly a pro at this because Matt, I, before we get into anything else, I'd like for you to tell everybody kind of what the RSP or the rookie scouting president is and and how they can get their hands on it because and I I say this every time you are on like I don't finalize my rankings of these rookies until I see what the work that you've done is I think it's the most valuable resource there is man I really appreciate it and you can find it just easily quickly it's at mattwaldman.com you can go there you can order it for download you'll get you create a password you'll get an email it's for 2195 you get a pre-draft that is out that was out April 1st, really it was out Sunday afternoon. And then you get a post draft that comes a week after the NFL draft. So the in the pre-draft, you're going to get scouting reports, really unadulterated, non-draft capital, non-team fit kind of looks at players based on film study. And I watch anywhere, usually, usually I chart at least four to six games on every player. Sometimes I get a little less when there's guys that – I just don't have as much access to film on like this year. It was Jaden Shorten and Monmouth. I could only get a couple of games. So I didn't get a chance to really do what I usually do. But most players, it's six to eight games. And then I watch a lot more than just those games. But I chart that out. I have a very dedicated process that is rooted in, you know, criteria that I've de learned, developed based off of certifications I got many years ago on how to develop best practices on um basically evaluating performance and so every position that i look at has a dedicated checklist that is transparent for everyone to see there's defined criteria of how i look at things how i score things and then i just take you through the process it's kind of like a choose your old your choose your own adventure book where it's 1183 pages of material in a pdf it's all bookmarked so it's easy to find but if you want to look at profiles that give you in-depth like scouting reports on these players, you can look at that. If you want to just look at charted rankings that are tiered and separated and give you little blurbs on each player and what their score was and what their combine workouts were, you can get that. If you want commentary about the position, you get that. That's all in the pre-draft. Post-draft, I give you like re-rankings based on fit, depth chart studies based on the where they fit with the entire team and what I'm projecting. And then you can look at, I do ADP studies. So basically, if I like Patrick Mahomes or Nick Chubb or A.J. Brown or Justin Jefferson more than the consensus or Sam Laporta or somebody like that, then I'm not telling you sometimes to go, yeah, I think Nick Chubb's the best player in the draft. When Saquon Barkley's the guy everybody wanted, I'll say you can get him in the second round based on ADP. So you can get your first round guy and you can get the best play running back. Apologies, Dan. But well, he's yeah, gone. So true. you guys don't care anymore anyway. But like, no, um, you know, you can get one of the best players in the draft in the second round. And I show you kind of how to go about doing that. So that's all for $21.95 at mountwaldman.com. Awesome, awesome stuff. And I think last year, and and Dan mentioned quarterbacks and 
you talked to us about quarterbacks and you actually had actually requested that because you said i don't get to talk about quarterbacks very much but one of the things that i enjoyed the most about that show was when you kind of just took a couple minutes to tell people a little bit about your uh, kind of a peek behind the curtain on your process specifically for quarterbacks and i was hoping you'd do just a little bit of that at wide receiver here today yeah i'm glad to you know my wide receiver checklist is probably i haven't counted how many criteria points there are but when I just kind of scroll down the sheet and if I take out the headings, it's probably over 150 criteria points that I look at. And like the, the categories are things like releases. I look at their stance. I look at concepts about releases. Like do they wait for defenders to shoot their hands before they counter? Do they attack leverage first? Do they get into the defender's toes? Do they understand how to be patient, but sudden with their movements, you know, things with how they use our hands, how they use they, their feet, how do they separate? How well do they separate um, versus different um, ranges of the field against man? Looking at stems, setups with breaks, how they look at how they work against zone, how they work, what their break types are, and whether they're executing them technically in a sound way, how they track the football, whether they're what kind of work they do on the boundary their hands positions based on the trajectory of the ball and whether they're using um, a optimal or appropriate technique and how they position themselves, how they handle contact, and then carrying the ball, blocking, you know, all those things are a part of it too. And these are all things that have evolved over the years. And even especially in recent years, probably in the past six to seven years, I started doing some studying. I, first, I looked at um, uh, the Colorado State, Jay Norvell, um, the Colorado State head coach. He used to coach Marvin Harrison Sr. and Reggie Wayne <laughs> We're so and a bunch of other guys. I know, right? <laughs> and uh, so I read his book many years ago and modeled a lot of what I did off of his coaching on recommendation from a scout that was a subscriber. And then I, be I became um, acquainted with... Um, with Drew Lieberman, who is known yeah. as the sideline hustle on YouTube, who is a wide receiver coach, the guy he was to Julian Edelman. He's worked with um, Devante, um, Dontavian Wicks last year, a number of guys that he's worked with, and he used to be an assistant coach at Rutgers. And he has a great site, and I, I can say that a lot of what I look at is modeled after what he teaches wide receivers and works with them on. Um, in terms of development. And so I I have that as a, a checklist of what I score. I watch multiple games. I give you kind of a charting of what I've looked at with these players in terms of how many targets were pinpoint versus how many were not quite pinpoint but catchable, whether they did it against contact or it was targets that weren't, whether they were in tight coverage. And I, I show you all that. So for, say, Isaiah Williams, the slot receiver out of Illinois, I looked at, you know, five games. I show you the five games. I show you which five games I looked at, the stats for it, and then the breakdowns for that tracking. And I just, you know, when, when I score these guys, when you read the RSP, it'll take you through, like, each of the categories, like the big t um, categories of, like, separation, route running, pass catching. And I, and I, basically rank those players, stack rank them in those categories and tell you who I think the best were, who I think notably needs improvement, um, and who I think need, you know, maybe needs a lot more work to even really like be decent at this for an NFL standard. And I go through overrated, underrated, and then I give you the scouting report, which just shows you my commentary and thoughts based on the checklist uh, about those players and give you more of a narrative based understanding of what the checklist is saying saying like these are the things that they need to work on in these situations he's good at separating against coverage like lad mcconkey for instance he's got great footwork he's got great speed but he did, he hasn't really proven that he can use his hands well to counter against defenders who are aggressive against him doesn't mean he can can't but it's something he hasn't shown right these are things he might want to know and know why maybe I have Ricky Pearsall slightly above him. Um, and people are going, wow, that's a little bit outside the consensus. I give you the why. 
Well, I, I think Ms. Thomas is probably upset here that he w didn't get to be here for that moment. He might have just come on just to cheer because I know he is a big, big Ricky Pearsall guy. So he'd be very happy to hear that you're excited. And from and a that, Georgia grad, too. Right. I mean, come on now. So uh, I, I will tell you, like just listening to you talk there, I could have asked 17 follow up questions. We are going to skim the surface. And that's why you guys do need to go get the RSP. Dan, one thing when, when Matt was talking about like these things that wide receivers need to succeed. And as we get into this class, I thought one of the trends we've seen from the last three, four or five years was that, man, it seems like a lot of the busts are all big tall guys <laughs> that look like they could have been related to Calvin Johnson. And a lot of the guys that are proving people wrong all weigh like 10 pounds less than I do. Um, and so it, I, I wondered if maybe we were going to get a transition. And then I start to look at the wide receivers that we're going to talk about on today's show, because we are going to do, this is our first part of the wide receiver preview. We'll do another show on Friday because there's just not enough time specifically for this position in this class to talk about all these guys. But we're going to talk about the top six by Dynasty League Football uh, ADP right now. And there's not a lot. Like, there's there's some big dudes. We, we, we are back to some alpha-looking dudes at the top. So how much, Dan, when, you, when you're evaluating these guys, do you care about the, the size we used to look for? I think a lot of that has to kind of do with just the classes we've had in the last few years versus the class we have now. When I look at it, like a guy last year, I believe we discussed him last year, Matt. We were both very low on Quinton Johnston compared to the consensus last year around this time. We both didn't like it. But then I look at some of the guys this year and I'm like, they're just totally different prospects. Like A.D. Mitchell is a completely different prospect. Even Brian Thomas, who I'm a little bit lower on cons than consensus, is, a, is an entirely different prospect than Quinton Johnston. So when I'm looking at the bigger receivers, what – might scare me a little bit more than like say can they can they create separation is are they a hands catcher are they letting the the ball come to their body how are they uncontested catch situations how are they in the air with their body control with their ability to position themselves and position their hands and extend them away from their frame and make those catches and you know tap their toes in like there's little technical things that i look for but it's not necessarily like if you're a certain size i'm going to rule you out because i'll be honest with you heath the way i look at it i'm still looking for the prototypical x's especially i maybe more so in like the gm sense of it like if i'm looking for how i would approach this as right. somebody as a fan of a football team but even as a fantasy football team if you can get those true x receivers to develop the way they can potentially as i think some of these prospects have the chance to do they're not there yet but have the chance to do now you have a guy who can win in the red zone now you have a guy who can win in third downs even when you shift coverage over the top because he can catch those contested plays or catch the catch situation so you know i still look for it but it is an interesting trend that we have seen develop that i wonder if it has more to do with just the last few classes of prospects and who's been in them you know, Matt, we always start our shows with three questions for our guests. These are going to be very specific to the wide receiver class. And I'm going to confess something because I know you have a, uh, a section in the RSP every year. It says why rankings suck. And <laughs> I, I understand that, especially as somebody that has to put That's together true. 4 million pieces of rankings every single year. But I will also confess that one of the things I do when I'm trying to get an idea of like how you feel about these guys at the very beginning, I will go to that three year ranking so yeah. I can see the prospects lined up against all the wide receiver prospects of the past. And wow, when you look at this wide receiver class oh, yeah. versus the last <laughs> couple of years. And so I, I just want to start right there and let you tell people like, how good is this wide receiver class? There's probably, I don't remember right off the bat, because again, remember, I just finished <laughs> writing this thing. So, but I'm pretty sure that there were like eight wide receivers that probably would have been ranked in the same tier or above the top wide receiver in last year's class. Um, you know, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome group. And the thing that I hate about rankings and why I joke that they suck is that I also do this tiered. So like what I would recommend to folks is do what he did. That's exactly, yeah. that's a great way to go about it, but pay attention to then go back and look at the, the 2024 tiers and look at the depth of talent score. Cause to me, like, I don't care if a guy, like a good example, I'm going to go with running back real quick. I don't care if a guy is like the second ranked running back or the 11th ranked running back if their score is in the same tier, right? It just means that maybe one, maybe two things that could be correctable 
if that changes, they could be much better. So really how you formulate your draft plan as a dynasty guy with RSP is you look for the tiers and go, okay, there's a lot of tier one wide receivers. That means I'm probably going to get a tier one wide receiver in the second round. It means I should get a decent starter, you know, on right. this, like a no worse than a fantasy wide receiver three early, uh, you know, in his career one to two years in, and maybe even a wide receiver two or a wide receiver one. So yeah, it's a great class in terms of potential. 2014 was the best class I remember for a while, which had, you know, Mike Evans, Brandon Cook, Sammy Beckham. Watkins, you know, Beckham, you, you know, a great crew of like potential guys. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. Be the same thing here. I always joke that you've got to vi divide it by like a, I always call it a fudge factor number, essentially, that injury and immaturity or bad team fit is going to like really you know, tear a lot of these guys down. But, you know, to have eight guys who are ranked as instant starters to franchise caliber receivers, meaning like they're going to be the anchor of their team and maybe the production leader early in their career, that's a historically yeah. good or a historically talented class. Good class, we'll find out. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. Like that, that, that uh, talent does not always turn into production. But especially fantasy production. But I, so let's let's talk about those wide receiver traits because you were mentioning all the different things you're looking for. Now everybody's process is just a little bit different. I think everybody probably values or weighs things a little differently. So is there is there one wide receiver trait you feel is either under or overvalued by consensus opinions? Yeah, I would say I would say speed is overvalued. Um, okay, greatly um, because. As long as the speed is baseline level for the role that you're projecting the player to be in, then that's fine. So if you're going to be a big slot, you don't need to be that fast. If you're going to be a flanker, you don't need to be super fast. If you're going to be an X, yeah, you probably need to have some speed, but that also depends on size, leaping ability, and route running too. You could have 4-2-4 four, four speed, but if you clap attack every ball and it goes through your hands like you're a little boy who's learning how to catch all those big balls, you know, then that probably doesn't matter so much. If you can't run compelling routes and get off the, you know, get off the line against tight man coverage in the NFL, it doesn't matter. So for me, un, you know, overrated is speed. Underrated, I would say, are the artistry that's needed to create releases and breaks with footwork. Um, do you understand how to use your feet to set up your hands both at the line and at the top of the stem? And it's not just how many moves you have. You know, it, you, you can look on, on X or look on any type of um, social media and people will talk about, oh, we use this technique to get a release. And that's great. You know, I mean, it's good to teach that and for people to understand. But there are a lot of wide receivers in, in this class and other classes who have maybe, a, a you know, a mini library filled with moves or a toolbox filled with moves, but how well they use them. Right. And it's the artistry of the patience and suddenness that you have to create. It's like, you know, it's like speaking monotone versus actually having like a natural tone variation in your voice to tell a story and that's the kind of thing that if you just talk like a computer and you do this then you yeah you could play music that way but go listen to a robot playing the saxophone on youtube and then go listen to an actual saxophonist <laughs> and you'll see a very big difference and that's the same thing that happens with route running is like i would argue that roman wilson is a good example of a route runner who does not, who sound, looks more like a, a robot playing the saxophone right now, whereas Malik Neighbors actually sounds like a, a recording artist signed to a, a really lucrative contract. Now, now, can that change? Because when you say that, like the thing that pops into my head, and I'm, I'm a big basketball head, obviously, also. And so I remember, and uh, Joel Embiid came into the NBA, and of course he didn't play for a while because he was hurt. But he'd spent so much time training and doing all this work. And so he gets onto the court in his first few NBA games, and he'll do a seven-combination post move when the guy didn't 
go for any of the first six moves. Like he could have, he could have got there on the first move, but he's been, he's got this training that he, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But eventually we know that Joel Embiid turned into an MVP. Like he, he figured that out. Do you think, is that one of those traits that like you feel like is kind of frozen or we can expect that to develop? You as can, a, yeah, it's a good question. You can expect it to develop. And yeah. that's why I like, what I like is showing a lot of this stuff so that people can go, okay, these are things I should be looking for right. in year two. So yeah, some guys do it. Some guys choose to drink. Some guys choose to like party. Yeah. Some guys think they made it already. Some guys lean on their God-given ability and Bill Belichick still pays them a whole bunch of money, even though <laughs> you know they they wore their welcome out in Miami. So, I mean, you know, there's all these situations where it's, it's a wide range. Some right. guys, you know, Devontae Adams is a good example yeah. of a guy who really figured out the artistry of how to, and he would tell you, he's like, I knew how to do all these things. I knew I could physically win, but it took me three years to figure out how to read coverages and right. read man to man and understand how to use what I used against them. And so, the, yeah, definitely. Now, I'd say the thing that's hard to teach is toughness at the catch point. Right. If you don't have it um, now, you probably aren't going to get it later. Right. I, I, I get that. And I, I want to go back to one more thing Matt said in that answer when he was talking about speed being overrated. I, I know we had some questions before the show even started about Xavier Worthy. That was not a slide against Worthy. Matt likes Worthy. We're going to talk about Worthy. Worthy. There's a big difference. In, and we had that joke on our show a couple times. I, may, I maybe even made it with Dan's, Dan that like Worthy may have run too fast because the guys that have run that fast haven't been any good. But the, the, the good thing is he was really good before he ran that fast. We don't have to worry about that. Final question. Who is the one wide receiver that in this class that you find yourself higher on than most? Anaya Smith, the uh, Texas A&M slot flanker kind of running back combo who basically may not even get drafted because he had an ACL year tear a couple years ago. And then he was busted for um, DWI and in the same, in the same arrest also for, uh, marijuana possession and and an illegal firearm. So it, you know, obviously the legal firearms probably just you should have given that license, kid. Right. The marijuana, I don't think the NFL really cares other than that. Like, come on, don't be stupid. We telegraph when you can you when you can uh, um, it, you right. know when you can use and when you can get off this. I mean, we don't say that to you, but we're basically doing it by our actions. But the DWI was pretty serious. So if he can prove that he's matured. He is a good route runner. He is a very strong pass catcher, and he's one of the best open field runners in this class. Very patient, good contact balance, very good at setting up defenders with movement. And he's a legit receiver. He's not just like some gadget play guy. Like He's tough at the catch point. He's good at setting up routes. He could play multiple positions. I just don't know if teams are going to be they're going to look at the off field right. and go, he hasn't grown up and they dig deeper and go, we'll take a chance on him, but we're not paying him until mm. we've seen some proof. That, right. Dan, do you have anybody uh, that you've kind of fallen in love with that you can't figure out why everybody else isn't higher on? Well, now people are higher on him because he had a great combine. It's somebody who Matt mentioned earlier. It's Ricky Parasol. He's just been my guy since the start of this before the combine. It's almost like when it's almost like when you're uh, it's like uh, when you're planning your fantasy football drafts and you have your sleeper and then he has those highlights in training camp. You're like, no, I didn't want to see that. I don't want that going around social media because I wanted this to be my guy. But no, I'm happy that he's getting the love he deserves now. He'd probably be my guy that I would say for that. Excellent, excellent stuff. We're going to take a short break and then we're going to do something. Brand new for the rookie wide receiver previews. We'll be right back. Okay, so we are back. We are going to go through a little bit more in depth on what are the top six wide receivers according to Dynasty Football current rookie ADP. This is not my top six wide receivers. These are not Matt's top six. Oh, they might be Matt's top six, but not necessarily in the right order. I don't believe number one is number one, but he's number one for just about everyone else. So let's start with Marvin Harrison Jr. And the argument that I hear most common for him is, like, there's almost no doubt he's going to be a very good wide receiver. He has the size you want. He has the skills you want. He has the pedigree you want. 
six three, over two hundred pounds, won the Blitnikoff Award. Like everyone seems to frame him as the safest, surefire number one wide receiver in this class. Is that fair, Matt, or do other people have both more upside and more floor than him? Um, I think it just depends on what you're looking for out of a wide receiver in the NFL. So that and that's probably why he, I think, is one of the top three wide receivers. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think it's a consensus thing. I don't think the NFL has it as a consensus thing. Right. Um, I think it's a consensus thing that Marvin Harrison Jr. has been the most celebrated college gotcha. wide receiver for the past three years. Um, and you know, he's a he's a good player, 6'3, 209. Um, great tracker at the boundary. That's probably his greatest skill is to play tight coverage at the boundary and win those X routes that everybody, you know, has looked for for years, even if there's been a lull in finding it. So he's that guy that can come down with the ball and win it over his shoulder and make those plays. He's a solid route runner. He can have some inconsistencies with how sharp his breaks are. And that's important in the NFL because in college, if you get, if you get two steps on a guy, um, you're you're covered. You're kind of covered in college for a lot of quarterbacks. If you get two steps on a guy in the NFL, you're wide open. If you get a half a step on a guy, you're open with a good quarterback. So you know every sharp turn makes a difference, and he has a little bit of inconsistencies there. He's got a little bit of inconsistencies with catching the football. Surprisingly, if you look at his game. And it's not just against Georgia, but like against Penn State, against a number of teams I watch. He has a habit where he tries to turn downfield to catch a football, and he uses underhand attack, and he and he and he can't get his hands up in time to get them together. So the ball goes between his hands, and it's happened numerous times where he ends up trying to position himself like he's trying to do something too fancy, and it ends up biting him, or he gets kind of confused about how he should attack it and thinks, let me try and get downfield as opposed to let me just get my arms up in front to the earliest point. He's also not the he's also not the niftiest runner of this group, meaning that he's he can he can bend away from defenders. He's not a lateral cut guy. He's not a big time tackle breaker in the open field. So when I hear people talk about him, I hear Josh Gordon, like he's like what Josh Gordon should have been. And they're, they've got similar builds when you think of them coming out of school um, before Gordon kind of bulked up more. Right. But I think that Josh Gordon was a more dynamic player. Um, I would say he's more an aspiring T. Higgins, Mike Williams type than he is a, you know, maybe a Larry Fitzgerald if he really takes it out of the park and keeps growing. But I don't, and that's a really good receiver and could be a co number one. But I don't see that as, I don't see that as a generational talent. I see it as a very good starter. Like I think he's closer to his ceiling than people realize. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to weigh in a little on Marv. I, I like that evaluation. I can see, I, I like that he, you see him more as like the T Higgins than the Josh Gordon type. I will say this on Marv, the, the thing that you mentioned earlier with how they release off the line of scrimmage and they create separation that way. To me, he was the best that I've studied so far. I've only done the big three receivers for the show. And I just sure. like now neighbors will win with the speed release, the jab or the fake jab. And that's fine. Like Antonio Brown made a career of that. So it can work if you have that kind of athleticism, but I always wonder like how that translates to NFL DBs who are all like the best you're going to play at the college level by far. But with Marv, I just feel like he's like a pass rusher. Almost. He has like a pass rusher plan that comes in in like 15 different ways. He can beat you, uh, you know, press coverage off the line of scrimmage. So I thought that stood out. And I did think there were some special moments to me. I'm like, there was a moment against Michigan state in the red zone where he wins a route. Uh, from the slot where he just creates separation that just I look at that play I watch it like five times Matt and I'm like a man who's six foot three should not be able to move his feet that way so I do think there are some special aspects to his game that stand out to me that maybe say that he has some left to uncover but I do think that if you're looking at him as just like the more polished wide receiver and maybe not have the athleticism obviously in the in the open field I think he had just five force missed tackles compared to like 30 for neighbors so there's clearly a difference there from like the ability in the open field and the speed so Matt you 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 made that comp when you said Higgins when you said Mike Williams and the, and the first thing that I thought was 
You know, it seems like one of the things that's making these guys really successful in the NFL is the ability to move all over the field. And we talk about like that has unlocked some wide receivers in the last couple of years to have just monster seasons. Do you see Harrison as somebody who can do that? Or do you think he's going to be stuck outside most of the time? No, I mean, I think he could probably play inside, outside. Um, I just don't think that he's probably he's a guy that you're going to mat, try and find matchups for him. And there's certain areas where he's going to have a matchup domination. Like I think on the outside, he's going to dominate um, as a boundary guy. But right. if you're going to want, him, if you're going to press him, like for me, I think that the press moves he has are good, but he does leave his chest open a little too much. And that's something where he's going to get jabbed there. He rocks off his back foot beginning to release. So he has some release tells that he should fix early in camp, but if he doesn't, you're going to see defenders be glued to him because he's what he does great is separate late. He's a great late separator. Even if they've got him jammed early, he'll uncover late. So if a, if a quarterback trusts him, that's good. Um, but that's the thing. I'd say inside, probably he's an X, and then he can be used as a big slot, kind of like Kenny Galladay. But early on in his career, you could take Kenny Galladay you know, and put him in the slot against a a safety or a linebacker, but now you're getting a much more skilled version of Kenny Galladay, um, you, you know, doing that type of work. I'm just glad Dan didn't go into convulsions when he heard that name. Dan, last last question. Um, and I, we'll talk about this with all with all these guys in terms of landing spot. It's kind of a different question for the top guys, though. So as far as Marvin Harrison Jr. goes, there has been a, a little bit of talk that possibly the Patriots could not take a quarterback in round one and take one of these wide receivers. Like how do you think that Harrison Jr. is the type of wide receiver early in his career that could succeed with a, a terrible quarterback situation? It's a great question. I mean, I've seen some terrible quarterback situations myself watching the New York Giants, and I've seen some <laughs> quarterbacks who can't get the ball out to receivers who can win one on ones on the outside for whatever reasons. They can't process it fast enough. I think a lot of people just don't realize so much of the game of quarterback is do you process information fast enough to get the ball outside, even when you have the one on one? So I think that would be a nightmare scenario going to the Patriots, quite frankly, especially when you're staring down the barrel of maybe Justin Herbert at five if the if it goes quarterback, 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 or Kyler Murray at worst. So, yeah, I, I don't know if he's scheme independent or I guess quarterback independent. I'm not sure anyone is. Uh, I would think that if you have a willing quarterback, that's fine. I don't know. Like if the Patriots, let's say they go Harrison at three. Right. They might come back and, and trade up and try to take a quarterback like a Michael Penix type. I think he would be perfect for Marvin Harrison, perfect per, like for his fantasy value. You need okay. someone who's willing to throw those outside passes, though. Very, very good stuff. That's Marvin Harrison Jr., now we're going to move on to the guy who is, and I'm not going to give away too much from the RSP because I want you guys to go get it, but the number one wide receiver in the RSP this year, the number one wide receiver over the last three seasons, Malik Neighbors, Matt, this guy just absolutely smashing records. And, and what he did this past year and then what he put on film, I think, probably changed a lot. You talk about Marvin Harrison as the most acclaimed, the most decorated wide receiver and there was a much bigger gap in perception between these two before this year, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was, I mean, so much so that, you know, I do Debbie Leagues, and I I was picking Marvin Harrison Jr. like three years ago. I right. didn't know anything about Malik Neighbors. Um, and then by the summer, I was like, oh, I wish I picked Malik Neighbors. Even though I like Marvin Harrison Jr., I was like, I, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had some shares in him, too. <laughs> So what separate, I know like when we talk about separation and I think this is a, a good time also to talk about rookie drafts because I've heard a lot of discussion of is Malik neighbors closer to Marvin Harrison or closer to wide receiver three. And that's obviously from people who have Harrison number one. What is it that makes neighbors for you the prize of this class? Sure. And they're both tier one receivers. Right. So, you know, again, if you're going to want to take Marvin Harrison, fine, go take Marvin Harrison. That's right. not a big deal to me on that level. Yeah. But um, neighbors to me, one of the things is that the RSP is not designed to draft for your league. It's designed to draft for all leagues, including the people in the NFL who buy the RSP as a cross-checking <laughs> device. So I'm not geared towards one particular offense. Um, so neighbors... To me, like while you know Dan made a good point that he's very good at the stick release and the using jabs and things like that, 
I saw a whole repertoire of releases that I thought were great against press coverage and the artistry was there. He knew how to use his feet first. He knew how to use double ups. He knew how to use the stick and double up as a kind of a fastball slider kind of combination, you know, change up type of thing. He understood how to use three quicks and one step stretches and two quicks and and the different types of handwork that he used. He could he could really counter very well. His route running with the pacing that he did was advanced. And then his ability at the catch point, he's someone that, like Marvin Harrison, can go up and win the ball. Now, not that the with the height Harrison has, but he was tough at the catch point. He would take hard hits. He didn't have issues catching the ball technically on any level. So it's a small difference is that I thought Malik Neighbors had I saw more footwork releases from neighbors that mattered to me um, and fewer gaps or opportunities that needed to improve, like with Harrison in terms of the tells that he showed that are going to get him jammed immediately in the NFL that college players just won't dare do. And that's the part of the projection of talent is that sometimes you got to look at things and go, okay, this isn't happening in the college game because teams are, they're too afraid, but uh, Jalen Ramsey's going to take one look at this kid opening his chest like that, and his hands are going to live right in the in between the numbers of Harrison, and it's going to make it a little bit tougher. Whereas with Neighbors, I'm looking at this stuff and going, no, nope, he's he's he doesn't have any of these issues. This is very technically sound. And then after the catch, I mean, you can see what he does after the catch. So you can see him if they need him at at split end. He's got the speed to do it, and he's got the leaping ability to do it. Probably not going to put him there. If you need him at flanker, which is probably where he's going to be at, he can give you a lot of different routes and run the whole route tree for you and tell the stories you need to do and do it with the craft. And he can win over the middle and win after the catch. And if you need him in the slot, well, if you get the luxury of putting this guy in the slot, um, he's going to kill you. Um, right. He's going to be a catch leader. He's going to be a yardage leader. He's going to make big plays for you. And so he's got the widest variety of potential to just be a dynamic player for you. And that's probably why he scores a little bit better than Harrison. Put Harrison in his best role with a good, with a better quarterback than neighbors. And Harrison's going to outscore him in fantasy. Put Roma Dunze there, probably the same thing. Put, um, put, you know, neighbors in that situation. He's going to, I think he'll rule in that regard. Okay. And I really like that breakdown for neighbors. Cause I think for fantasy purposes, he could end up being a better prize pick for all those reasons. I look for, for fantasy. I look for, can you win at all three levels as, as a receiver? And he can, he wins short, intermediate and deep and he wins deep. You talked earlier, Heath, you asked, you asked Matt, like, can a receiver get better at that? And you're discussing releases and the ability in your routes. Now, I believe you can get better at your release off line of scrimmage, but as far as like getting better at the top of the route stem, like as far as breaking down your hips, the ankle flexion, all those things, some of that to me is just natural. And you can watch neighbors on these double moves. And it's like these DBs are playing 15 yards off coverage to begin with. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much space they give him. They're completely left. Um, like you watch some of these, I've, I've broke down a few games for, for the big blue vendor podcast. And there was like 40, 50 yard bombs that were just left on the field where Jaden Daniels either under threw him or just missed the read where neighbors created separation. And then Matt mentions after, the catch after the catch he reminds me in some ways of Kadarius Tony after the catch which is crazy because he was one of the best receivers I ever studied for the Giants at least after the catch and he reminded me of Alvin Kamara with the contact balance like neighbors contact balance you only truly see that usually for running backs but you see it with a receiver here so for fantasy purposes I actually feel like I haven't really done my rankings yet for dynasty but I'm considering moving even though I like Harrison better for the NFL moving him ahead of Harrison for because what we look for in the fantasy game he may offer more that's good stuff. I, one thing I wonder, Matt, and we don't talk about age a whole lot, um, and we had this weird time, and there'll be a little bit of that still this year with the last couple of years because of COVID where we had guys that were 24 years old or or not the early declares, and, and most of the guys we're going to talk about today, they are, but still Malik Neighbors almost a full calendar year younger than Marvin Harrison Jr. And for me, I know like that, age 18 to 22 development is pretty huge. Does it, does it give him any bonus in your mind? The fact that he's doing this at, at 20 years old or 19 years old, like being that much younger. 
Well, I'm not one to really study that, to be honest, because, yeah. but I'm going to quote someone who I know does and had a really good conversation with them about this. And that's Dwayne McFarlane over at Fantasy Life. He used to write at the RSP way back in the day. Yes. And he's just come out with a wide receiver model. And one of the things that he talked about, because we were talking about age as well, and because I got some questions about with quarterbacks, and I said, my feeling with quarterbacks is, is look, it's such a hard position. And yeah. there's so many variables that honestly, the older you are, the more the game slows down for you. If Steve Young's saying, I didn't really understand how much the game slowed down to me until I turned about 30, you know, then maybe we should not do that with quarterbacks, you know, because there's there's too much. But with a with wide receivers, one of the things he mentions in his model is that when the wide receiver plays for a team where you can quantify that their level of competition and their level of success as an offense is really strong and it's a strong team and that wide receiver starts early in his career at an early age, that means he's beaten out some really quality prospects to get on the field and earn, even if you're just earning playing time right. at Alabama or LSU then that's a statement about how talented you actually are. Um, so yes, I think from a from Dwayne's perspective, you're going to get bonus points probably for that. And I can see the logic for that. Um, now, does that mean that it's a curse for a player who's very talented, who doesn't come from a good program, who waited later to, to develop? Not necessarily. It just depends on the skills that he's lacking are they things that he already has, like as Dan mentioned, does he have the bend, the hip flexion, and it, and it shows up in other areas, but it doesn't quite show up with his at the top of his stem, but you see it with change of direction skills mm -hmm. already, or with a different type of route. Then you can project maybe that they'll, there's a potential for some success there, and there may be some circumstances that, that can be difficult. But again, when we're modeling players, we're looking for the easiest answer and getting rid of all the ifs, as many ifs as possible. So I don't deal in, I like to deal in ifs. So, the, <laughs> you know, so I like to look at, especially, you know, later on, like in the post draft, I'll eliminate some ifs. Right now, I'd rather dwell in the ifs because that's where you find the Isaiah Pacheco's or the Nick Chubbs or, True. you know, players like that who, who go, you know, if this didn't happen or if these things happen, then there's some there's some possibilities. And that's where you can gain an advantage if you're looking at the context deep enough. So, yeah, it's great. a great question. Great, great stuff. Let's, let's get to wide receiver three by current rookie ADP. Um, and you mentioned him just a moment ago, kind of putting him in the same class of these guys, definitely in the same tier in the RSP. And I think that's really valuable for dynasty managers to know, because there are people who act like there's a tier, maybe a tier break either after Harrison or after Harrison and neighbors. We, we don't necessarily see it that way. Roma Dunze out of Washington. Now this is not a kid who played at LSU or Ohio state, but still had a ton of success last year. Another guy over six foot over 200 pounds looking more like that prototypical NFL wide receiver. What, how did you break down Roma Dunze, Matt? Yeah. I mean, to me, I think he's probably the best combination of size, speed, quickness, and technique, um, you know, overall abilities you're looking for probably in this class, you know, 6'3", 212. I mean, I think at worst, he's like peak Allen Robinson at worst. I think at best, and I just saw this yesterday because now I'm starting to digest other draft content right. now that I'm done. And I saw Matt Harmon talk about how that he comped him to Devontae Adams. And that's the guy at the top of my comp for him as well. So it's nice to see that... Um, it's nice to see that Matt and I saw the same thing in terms of an overall broad picture on him. I think that Odunze is probably the guy who isn't as conceptually as refined as neighbors as a route runner, but he's good enough to produce immediately. Um, you know, the things that I think he does well is bait defenders with his pacing and angles during his stems. He really understands how to set up and turn the hips of the defender or to get them to, to go in the wrong direction. Um, 
I think he has a few breaks in his repertoire that's going to get the job done um, with most routes. Really good body control and tracking, and he doesn't leave his feet unnecessarily for targets, so he really understands how to extend and win the ball. He's good after the catch. He's someone that I think will only get better as a route runner, um, and as a, as a result of that, when you look at that size, that speed, the already strong baseline of route running that he can play now. That's why he kind of has that um, Devonte Adams kind of upside there. And I think that, you know, I, it might be unfair to say that he's already as good or better than Allen Robinson at his peak because Robinson was really awesome at his peak. It was just a very short peak. Yeah. I love Bromo Duns. I have him right there with these two. I think, you know, the thing with the Dunze is I almost see him. My come for him is like a bigger version of Chris Olave. That's kind of where I see his game from nice. watching him on tape. And I think part of his game that I love so much is that people look at him like, oh, is he not fast enough? And then you watch the tape and you're like, he is plenty fast enough. He led all college football in deep yards, led him in deep catches. Even when he's not open on the vertical plane, he does a better job than some of these receivers in stacking and getting itself in the position to make the catch. He had he, this is the craziest stat of the entire draft season in my mind. He caught 75% of his contested catch situations. That number is out of control. Three fourths of all contested catch situations he came down with. That's crazy. But what really stands out to me is you can also throw him the ball in the short level of the game. Cause as Matt says, he's much better after the catch than people realize he's not necessarily like neighbors. He doesn't look like he's bursting in and out, but he just understands space so well and where to position himself to create the maximum amount of yards after the catch on those quick hitting screens and things like that. He does a great job there. And then one final thing that doesn't help us for fantasy, but I just love watching his tape. He's a hell of a blocker and he is a willing blocker and he's going to really, that there are some plays where he just seals the edge and you're just like, Oh my God, God, is this guy good at blocking for a wide receiver? So I just love watching his tape. He's an exciting prospect. One thing that Dan mentioned that I thought was a great point is what he does at the catch point against contested catches and that ca contested catch rate. When you look at it on film, the thing that he does that separates him from what people – I think people saw Quentin Johnston and what they were really looking at was Roma Dunze. I mean, because <laughs> really what Johnston couldn't do it when you watched him is that – he wasn't a great player in terms of getting position at the catch point. There's something called a jump up and through technique, which is where when the quarterback throws a back shoulder fade or under throws the ball and the receiver comes, turns around and leaps up to catch the ball. What we see oftentimes is say Dan knows this intimately because Colin Johnson was a giant. Colin Johnson at Texas used to do this all the time. He would lean back and literally make these like, diving stretches where he opened his chest to the to the defensive back and maybe he caught the ball at texas doing that but in the nfl it doesn't work because you need to be jumping straight up and down stefan diggs is great at that as a small right. receiver mm -hmm. so is neighbors adunze with his size understands that as well and his jump up and through is great he has a good pullback so his whole technique with positioning pre-catch so and post-catch is why he has a 75% um, catch percentage in those in those areas. We're going to take one more short break, but before we do, Matt, I want to ask you, when, when we look at these three, Harrison, Neighbors, Adunze, is it fair to say that we could get to the first week of May, and depending on what happened in the NFL draft, any of these three could be number one in the post-draft update? Easily. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, easily. Are they the only three? No. Okay, well, then we will talk about nice. maybe maybe the fourth or fifth or sixth right after this. Now, I knew this was going to happen when we had Matt on, and I laid out the rundown. I said, I'm being too ambitious, Matt. I, I asked you for an hour. If all, an hour is all you can give me, I understand. Nope. If we can push just a little bit longer, that would be fantastic. I'd like to get through three more wide receivers. Wide receiver four by current rookie ADP is Brian Thomas. And I just want to say, like, we're going to talk about four, five, six, Brian Thomas, Troy Franklin, Xavier Worthy would make a heck of a track relay team. These guys are blazing fast, but the difference between the three is that Brian Thomas is also 6'3 and 210 pounds, whereas the other guys are kind of little guys. Is this another one of those guys for you, Matt, that could end up as wide receiver one in this class? Um, I think he could down the line. Yeah. Um, I'm I would say that I wouldn't bet on it, but if it, it, you know, it's one of those things that a month from now, knock on wood, nobody gets hurt, but say somebody does or some weird thing happens off the field that we didn't expect, um, you, you know, and now we're looking at 
Thomas is one of those candidates who's in a good fit, then yeah, it could happen because he's he's a burgeoning um um what would I best put it? He's developing well as a route runner. He's on his way. I'll put it that way. He's capable of being a split end in a West Coast offense. He could probably even be a develop into a flanker if he really develops his route game at a higher level. But teams are going to leverage his speed, his height, his length, his ability to go up and win the ball. He's better after the – kind of like Odunze, he's a little bit better after the catch than people give him credit for. He works through contact effectively, really sound hands, um, though there's some isolated issues with attacking the ball. Um, they're very small. They're minor compared to, say, like Cortland Sutton, who's a perfectly good NFL wide receiver – even if I like to joke that you're going to have, you know, probably three ca- three drops a game or one to three drops a game with him, but you know you're going to get one to one to three big plays as well. Um, he's that he's like that power forward. You got to feed the ball a lot too, and they're going to miss a lot of shots, but they're going to make a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, but he's kind of an AJ Green light type of player, um, Brian Thomas. I think that the, I like the comp with him. Um, he also has a good feel. He's not just like the sidekick to Malik Neighbors who benefited from Malik Neighbors. He's a guy I think that will prove that he can stand on his own and will develop into no worse than a big play wide receiver too for fantasy purposes. Um, you know, within the first, I'd say one to two years. Dan, is this are we still in the range of guys that you just can't even imagine them getting to round two two? Are we still in the the surefire round one wide receivers with Brian Thomas? And what do you think of him? Yeah, for sure. For me, I mean, you know how I am with Dynasty Heath. I'm very wide receiver heavy, so I'm not I'm gonna be leaning. Well, I meant NFL here. draft, actually. Oh, NFL draft. Yeah, I would say Brian Thomas is probably surefire just based on the physical traits. I'm not as high on him as Matt, uh, just from watching LSU. I think there's a lot of potential here and I think he's very raw prospect, but for fantasy, I wonder like if he would have done better in a different era before we had all these defenses moving to like the Fangio principles where you have all these safeties and the two high, because he does have that Trump card right now, but I still think there's a lot like for me, like if he's going to play flanker in the NFL, you said maybe he can get out to that and play and play a position. I'd like to see a little bit more as far as like his route running goes and his ability to win in the short and intermediate areas of the field. So that I think can still be developed. He wouldn't be my wide receiver four, but I think he's definitely based on his size, speed and his upside going to be a first round pick in the NFL. And, and just as a reminder, like we're not using Matt's, order of rankings we're not using my order of rankings we're just using right. adp's order of rankings yeah. right now yeah, and that's he's not my wide receiver four either but, right. Uh, but, I, right i wonder with a is there a is there a risk here matt that with his skill set that he could end up in a situation like we've seen for george pickens over the last couple of years where he spends a lot of time running up and down the sideline <laughs> but not producing fantasy points oh without a doubt i think that that's a it's a quite viable possibility with him and it just he turns into this guy who's just a big play he's used kind of like a gabriel davis in Mm -hmm. a sense but but not in an offense that targets gabriel davis to the level that that uh josh allen does right exactly josh allen quarterback to even get those plays right exactly so so that's brian thomas let's let's move on to the the slightly more diminutive uh, well, not necessarily diminutive, just light in the case of Troy Franklin. And I was surprised to see after the combine that Troy Franklin still ranks as wide receiver five by current rookie ADP. He was a guy I was pretty fond of early in my research. And I I don't get the impression, Matt, that you're necessarily putting a huge amount of weight on the combine. And so the reason I say that is because I know that he's not your wide receiver five either, not a top five wide receiver for you. And so what I guess you can talk about the good things about Troy Frank Franklin as well, but what, what are the things that are concerns for you? Well, he would have been top five last year. He probably right. would have been top five the year before. So <laughs> let's, let's frame it he's that way from the beginning yes, of the right. show. I mean, he's an, crazy. He could be an instant starter. That's again, you know, the fact he's wide receiver 10 on my board. And he's got an instant starter grade is not usual for most classes that I'm doing. So, you you know, he has some occasional bouts where he clap attacks the football. When you clap attack the football, generally what that means is that the ball striking your palms because your hands aren't together enough. And the ball has a ricochet effect that's much more violent than if these 
really subtle pieces of human engineering are all able to clamp onto it with the various levels of uh, sophistication that they do with your brain that you're not even thinking about. It's, all, it's um, also known as the Quinton Johnston effect. No, I'm just kidding. It, it, there you go. We've there done too go. much Quinton Johnston. You know? That's right. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, he's, he's someone that as a, his route game isn't quite fully done. You know, he can, he's someone that has the elite speed, but as Dan mentioned, if you're just going to be used as a speedster in a cover two era, that's going to be difficult. Um, but he does have an understanding of how to get off the line pretty suddenly. He has some good combos of footwork to be able to, to earn separation. Um, he just needs to do more with his attack. Like he doesn't attack stems at full speed. And when you play man to man coverage and you're not using your speed, as the way to set up your underneath routes fully, then you, you know that's that's a tell that defenders are going to be able to handle. If you're using that deep speed well, defenders have to play that first. So he's got to get better at that. Um, you know, but he does work back to the ball. He has some snap with his breaks that's pretty strong. Um, so I think he's going to give you. The op he's going to put himself in an opportunity to contribute right away. And if he can develop the route techniques against man coverage to where he's beating at least the secondary corner, um, he's going to give you value. But that's still a little bit of an if year one. Year two, year three, I think you're going to see this guy develop into someone that may be like, like Jamison Williams. I think he's on par with what Jamison Williams was rated to be, um, at least from my perspective. And then maybe a guy that I really liked that just couldn't stay healthy, but I thought was more talented than both of them was Paul Richardson. I thought Paul, oh, Richardson, Paul Richardson was a yeah. dog, you know, and he was an unbelievable, you know, anybody who would win the Brandon Lloyd, the R, Matt Waldman RSP, Brandon Lloyd Invitational on pass catching, aerial pass catching, gets bonus points in my book. And Troy Franklin, I don't know if he's quite there, but he's he's got some comparable things with uh, Paul Richardson. Yeah, my only follow-up there would be like, I feel the exact same way as Matt. In any other class, especially last year's class, he'd be up there for me. In this class, he's probably closer to that 10 range for me as well. I think what I would want to see personally, I would want to see him in like a Mike McDaniel kind of offense if he can get to that kind of yeah. fit. Like that's where I want to see Troy Fleming. As far as what do we want for fantasy? How do we get some points for fantasy and how do we maximize their usage there? So that's where I'm at with Franklin. So I, I do want to ask you, Max, I kind of stumbled over the size before. He's 6'1", but only 176. Now the 6'1 yeah. part's absolutely fine. 176 is a lot, for me, at least seems a lot different at, at 6'1 than it does at 5'10". Um, does does that uh, lightness or that light frame show up on tape as well, or is it is that not a problem? Um, it's going to show up on NFL tape. It's more of a projection mm -hmm. thing. So okay. you look at Jahan Dotson as a good example, as a player that you go, really good player. We all know he's good. But is he going to disappear in games because he's going to be covered well by physical corners, or is he going to be in situations where the quarterback's resident, um, reticent to target him? because of his frame is he going to miss time because of that frame yeah. that those are the things that nfl decision makers are going to have concerns about which leads to draft capital being you know declining um as, and it's so it's more of a perception thing based on history but there are also players like oh isaac bruce who played many years in the league or before our time cliff branch when i was growing up and watching mel blunt suplex the guy on his head <laughs> and still play another 10 years and have a couple of pro bowls after that moment where it looked like he got killed on the field. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that I think if the player has strong routes and he can play physically tough inside, um, the size thing doesn't concern me as much. Dan, you mentioned, um, that you'd like to see him in Mike McDaniel's offense. It seems like maybe, his chances of going in round one may have, according to some perception, been hurt by the combine performance. So let's, uh, how, how about if he's a day two pick to an Andy Reid offense? Would you be okay with that? I mean, I always get scared <laughs> of wide receivers and Andy Reid offense because it takes so long to learn that system, though Rasheed Rice did a pretty good job himself. But I would say that would be exciting. Any, anytime I can get Patrick Mahomes, I just think with, with Franklin, the thing I do like about him more than, more than most maybe is that I see like that quick twitch 
those quick twitch traits that I think could be great in a specific style system. But I do worry, like what Matt says, when he's talking about like the size being an issue, what I worry about is like when you project at the NFL level, like he said, okay, if you, can you trust these guys to beat press man on the outside? And if not, then what are they? They're now a slot guy. And now I need them to be in a Mike McDaniel type offense where you're using them in motion and you're getting them in all these different places. Cause if not, like you're, you're really pin pigeonholed into a certain role that I'm not sure how you can find too much production from. So it's, it's an interesting spot with these, these, these receivers for me who are like a little bit under that 180 range though. I mean, they, like, like Matt said, there's always outliers. Like I never had this issue with Devonte Smith. I never felt like this was going to be a problem for him at the NFL level. That is Troy Franklin. We've got one more wide receiver to go through here. It is Xavier Worthy, the fastest guy, not just at the Combine this year, but I guess at the Combine ever. And another guy who's got some size questions, 5'11", 165, on the positive side, just 20 years old. On the more positive side, number four wide receiver for Matt Waldman. Like, this is your favorite guy we've talked about since the break, right? Probably so, yeah. I mean, so he's... Look, the... One of the things I remember watching him early on and going, wow, he fights the ball a lot. And so you're going to hear a lot of people talk about how he has some drops or he mm -hmm. juggles the ball more than people may have let on or what his buzz is worth. But he also makes a ton of tough catches. So he, you know, to me, when I see a player make tough catches with good technique and he's not jug fighting the ball doing it, and then he has somewhere he fights it a little bit, but he still makes the catch. Maybe he needs to shore up a couple of things and tighten up. But overall, his positioning strong. He's good. He's reliable in the middle of the field, uh, making tough catches. He can win the ball at the boundary with his um, explosion, with his positioning. He's obviously very strong after the catch in terms of what he can do with his quickness and, and speed. And there's a lot more to me of him being an Isaac Bruce, Deshaun Jackson type of player, not late Deshaun Jackson who played two games, led fantasy leagues <laughs> in points in those two games and then was hurt and you didn't see him for the rest of the year. But Deshaun Jackson with the Eagles, when he had some seasons where you're like, you know, I mean, I remember I've done some studies on wide receivers where it's talking about how many guys have had wide receiver one caliber seasons yeah. over the years. And Deshaun Jackson's pretty high on that list of only a handful of names who've done it. So way back in the day, Jackson and Isaac Bruce before him, full fledged route runners could play tough, could be could be your intermediate receivers as well. I think Xavier Worthy has a chance to to show he can do a lot of that. At worst, he to me, he's a better version of what Titus Young could have been if Titus Young wasn't um, an immature and criminally minded human being. Um, you, you know, in terms of the promise that he briefly showed in Detroit and at Boise State, or KJ Hamler before KJ Hamler's heart issues, um, and maybe what. Hamler's promise was the way people saw him. I think Hamler's a couple of tiers below Worthy. Worthy's more in between like a higher version of Young and, and approaching that Deshaun Jackson, Isaac Bruce tier. Yeah, what stands out to me about what Matt broke down there was Worthy's willingness and his toughness over the middle to make those catches because I look at it like this. Like we talked about earlier with so many teams going to that cover three, Vic Fangio principles playing that style of defense. Well, you need a receiver who's going to be able to be tough against zone in those in, in those situations because A, you're seeing a lot of that. And B, you're also getting a situation where you got to trust that these wide like that you got to trust these wide receivers in those in those spots that maybe you might not trust other wide receivers. And so I think that he stands out from that maybe above some of the other smaller receivers. Now, Matt, I get I get the impression because we talked about with Thomas probably still an NFL first round or Franklin maybe falling to the second. Worthy's seems to be from the buzz building so far pretty likely to be a round one, maybe even a middle of round one guy in the NFL draft, right? Yeah, and I think that that's well deserved. I think that you know it's well deserved because he's he's legit a good pass catcher and decent route runner. Yes, as opposed to just a fast guy that the NFL can kind of fall in love with. Right. 
That, that, that really helps when you're good at football and then you're also the fastest guy there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, I had one more thing on that. Like I, I actually, and he, he said I could share this on any podcast or anything, but I, I speak with Carl Banks, who's a former Giants player and he works with teams. And he, and he told me from speaking with NFL evaluators and scouts, one thing that they're really stressing is, and this is more for quarterback play, but it can go for wide receivers too, for someone like Worthy, is how these, they're charting plays and they're stressing how these quarterbacks perform against zone. Because they believe like the zone spots, the key spots against zone and what they want to see based on, you know, some of the things we discussed, how defense are changing. So when you see Worthy out there, and I've seen this too, and his ability to beat some zone coverages with those catches over the middle, it stands out versus other receivers. And it means a lot to these NFL valuers. So if it means a lot to them, it's likelier that he's going to have higher draft capital. If he has higher draft capital, we know from a dynasty standpoint, from a fantasy standpoint, gives him a better chance to be fantasy successful. Yep, agree with all that, except I would say Carl Banks, former Cleveland Brown. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Martin. <laughs> that is fantastic. That's Xavier Worthy. That's the top six wide receivers by current rookie ADP. I had some questions about what about AD Mitchell? What about this guy? We will have another wide receiver preview on Friday. We will definitely talk about AD Mitchell and at least six more wide receivers that we've not broken down on an individual basis. But I, Matt, before you go, man, it's always so great to have you on the show. I always appreciate you making the time going a little bit extra here. Please tell everybody one last time where they can find the RSP. Sure. The RSP is at mattwaldman.com. You can download it there, pre-draft and post-draft. Again, it's one of the two most purchased draft guides by NFL people, according to um, Old Miss recruiter Alex Brown, who meets with these guys on a regular basis and says that they use it for cross-checking purposes. Um, I will joke that I was told by somebody that, um, that there was an NFL owner who was well aware of the work, um, and basically he was asking about um, pl- folks to, to read and he put the pen down when my name was mentioned. So no, I'm well aware and put the <laughs> book away. So we'll just put it that way. Uh, that was kind of a nice little fantasy moment for me. So, well, it, yeah. it's absolutely well-deserved. I know like I've been trying to get Dan on a show for two months and the only thing I had to tell him was Matt's coming on and Dan's like, Oh, <laughs> I'll make time that day. <laughs> A little bit of exaggeration, but I'll take it. (laughs) (laughs) Dan, thank you for being here, Matt. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who was active in the chat today. You guys were awesome. Thank you to everybody who's listening on the podcast later. We will talk to you on Friday.